Hi all! I hope you are all doing well and you are enjoying this wonderful day at All Hey Day. I'm really grateful for all of you that have tuned in and thankful for the invite from Harry and Josh and for their agility in changing this format very fast. I really wish that I, I would be right there with all of you in person, uh, but that also means that probably we're gonna connect at a more global level. So uh, thank you so much for tuning in. And I hope that you're all very excited about learning about serverless as well, uh, because you are in for a journey, my friend. So a race of hyper-intelligent pan-dimensional beings once built themselves a gigantic supercomputer called Deep Thought to calculate once and for all the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. And for seven and a half million years, Deep Thought computed and calculated, and in the end, it announced that the answer was, in fact, 42. And so another even bigger machine had to be built to find out what the actual question was. And this computer, which was called Earth, was so large that it was frequently mistaken for a planet. And sadly, however, just before the critical moment of the readout, the Earth was unexpectedly demolished by the Vogons to make way, so they claimed, for a new hyperspace bypass. And so all of hope of discovering a meaning for life was lost forever. And while I was reading The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, I couldn't believe that in this story I, I could identify some of the challenges and some of the patterns that we experience when building serverless applications. So with serverless applications, it is rather hard uh, or it's not straightforward to persist state in between calls um, as it is with traditional applications. Um, it is difficult to maintain long running, coordinate long running applications um, and all functions will time out after a preset amount of time. So similar to our story, where even though we were able to compute the answer to the ultimate question, we actually weren't able to retrieve the ultimate question anymore. Uh, we can see this pattern of not being able to maintain state in between function state. Um, and then this is actually a, an orchestration, a workflow a, of a long running operation where um, we set out to identify the the answer to the ultimate question, we compute, and then by the time we finish that compute, we actually lost what we wanted to do. Um, and the demolishing of Earth is very much similar to how our functions in serverless timeout as well. Um, currently, you can set up your functions to run for as long as 15 minutes in a um, pay-by-use use case. But that's the end. If, if you haven't finished your compute um, during that time, then that means that your function will time out. So I, I've, I've talked about three different challenges that we can experience when building serverless applications, but we haven't really talked about any of the benefits or what are some of the patterns that we can use and why would we actually use serverless. Uh, so let's, let's dive into that um, and see how the story evolves over time. One of the key things when we're building applications is being able to build them fast. Uh, time is crucial when building products. And that might be because uh, there is a very tight deadline to build that application or because um, your market is time sensitive and you need to grow really fast to build new features really fast. And serverless is here to help you spend that time on things that are really important instead of necessarily spending, on, uh, sp spending time on shiny stuff that isn't essential. And when we incorporate serverless into our applications, we no longer have to worry about configuring servers. And that's because the platform 
provider will be doing that for us. Um, another key thing about serverless applications is that they will um, they will auto scale our compute so that it meets the workload that is being uh, run at this particular time. Um, and you only pay for the amount of compute and memory that you're using. And Anthony Casalena wants to empower every single person out there to build their personal website without having to code. In his own words, Squarespace is working to solve the problem of self-expression. And to get started back in 2000, he needed $30,000. That's how much money he had to spend on buying two different servers that would host his very first version of Squarespace. And after his initial investment, he had to uh, he had to figure out where he would ho also host his servers uh, and turns out that initially he did that in his dorm room but that didn't sound like a great solution because you can imagine the, the room of a dorm room it's much smaller uh, than what two different servers would need in order to function properly so it didn't take him long uh, very long to um, move onwards to renting space in a in an actual data space uh, data center. So he invested initially $30,000 to buy two servers and then he also had to rent a data center space so that he could host those servers and all of this just to put out his very first version of Foursquare so that all of his users can experience it and get feedback from that. And not long after that, he actually experienced his very first outage as well and, and the panic of losing all of his user data and with that, um, all of his business as well because at that time, most of his data was actually part of his business. And eventually, he also had to replace the original servers and buy new ones. So $30,000, that was the initial cost of building a product for Anthony and probably for a lot of other innovators like him uh, back in the day. And virtualization, also known as infrastructure as a service, it freed up the burden of that initial investment for a lot of startup and for a lot of uh, organizations. And Serverless is actually the latest step on the path of taking away that burden of infrastructure and has a similar impact on getting you started with your products. Only now it, it frees you up from spending time on planning, configuring and managing servers. And this is a code pen that you that Sarah Drasner has built to um, to exemplify the the evolution from virtualization, well, actually from buying your own hardware um, towards where we are right now, where we can use this pattern that's called functions as a service to deploy our code into the cloud. And much like high level programming languages are an abstraction of code, serverless is an abstraction of cloud infrastructure or cloud resources. Um, and when we're programming in a low level language, we need to understand the memory requirements for our code to run. We need to explicitly allocate and deallocate memory. And it's the same with traditional cloud applications or even traditional applications that we need to put out there for our customers to experience. Uh, we need to estimate the workload at any given moment in time and provision the infrastructure required to run with it. And usually what happens is that engineers will over provision so that they make sure that whenever there's a spike in workload or a spike in traffic, um, users can still access the application. And what that leads to is that currently the average usage of uh, data centers and hard and, uh, and computer servers is around at around 20%. Uh, which means that we are wasting a lot of resources, both in terms of money, but also we are impacting the environment by keep, keeping up a lot of servers without necessarily using them. And that's a cue for you to also join in Asim's talk on the topic of sustainability and how can we write code more responsibly so that it doesn't impact our planet and our environment.
But back to serverless, uh, just like how high level programming languages abstract away the burden of configuration, enabling us to build applications faster and write code faster. Serverless enables us to focus on the code that's relevant to our product without having to worry about babysitting servers. Basically, serverless gives us the ability to focus on the important things right from the beginning. Uh, and in our case, important means solving problems first. We're really passionate about solving problems, writing code, and just running with it. The other, the other key thing about serverless is that um, it helps us scale our products and scale our applications based on user demand. And let's look at, a, at an example when, where that was very much needed. So every five years, millions of Australians fill out a survey for the census. And in 2016, the Australian government decided to run the census online, which is a very sensible decision given the times that we live in. Uh, and they spent $9 million on building a survey form and told everyone to go home and fill out the form. And that's exactly what happened. Everyone went back home after work and they filled in the survey at the exact same time. I bet you know what comes next. Next thing you know, the website has crashed and census fail is trending on social media. And the government managed to gather very little data and it ended up spending a lot more money investigating and fixing issues related to the failure. The weekend after the failure, in a completely different environment, two students at a hackathon, they rebuilt the census website. Uh, they did that in 72 hours and they used serverless. And by the end of the three days uh, that they had to build this application, they also wanted to make sure that the application actually supports all the load that was um, was was estimated for the online census. And it turns out that they were able to serve more requests than the initially predicted load for the census website. With serverless, we can be sure that our applications will scale automatically to meet the current workload. And I've used the term scalability, but let's have a look, a closer look at what it actually means. Um, so scalability is a term that's used to describe a system's ability to cope with increased load. So answering questions like what happens when our application grows from maybe a thousand active users to 10,000 active users? How about from 1 million to 100 million? Our system will probably have to deal with an increased number of concurrent requests and process a lot more data, larger volumes of data. And auto scalability is a way for us to scale up and down um, the number of compute resources depending on the actual load that is incoming. And the goal is to maintain a reliable performance even when our load parameters have changed. And with serverless, the platform will dynamically add and remove resources based on the number of incoming events. Scalability is a hard problem to solve. And by outsourcing the job of monitoring and spinning up new instances, we get to focus on understanding how our components in our system communicate and optimize for that particular task as opposed to babysitting servers. Finally, probably one of the most important aspects of serverless is that you only pay for the resources that you're using. For example, in a month, let's say you have a million invocations using up to 128 megabytes of memory and running for less than a second. That's going to cost you zero dollars. Yes, you heard that correctly, zero dollars. Nowadays, you can have someone doing all the hard work of building the hardware, spinning up um, all the instances that you might need and configuring all those servers for us and then adjusting based on the incoming load, run one million times during a month and we pay absolutely nothing for it. 
what an absolute great time to be building applications and products. And, and more than that, what a great time to be creative and kind of take all of those ideas that we wrote down in a notebook and start building them and deploying them um, to our users te to test them out. Now, let's increase that number of requests from 1 million to 5 million. Um, keep using the same amount of memory and CPU. It will now cost you $5. And that's less than the cost of a Starbucks coffee. So that's, that's not too much. I, I absolutely call that a win. And I hope that by now you are all excited about all the great things that you can build and you can achieve by using serverless. Uh, and we're going to spend the next few minutes just looking at how can we get started and what are some of the what are some of the use cases that we recommend that you use serverless for. And the first one that comes to mind, and it's one of the most popular use cases for serverless, is actually web APIs. And I, I'm thinking that this is probably something that sounds very familiar to all of you out there. And it's, it's actually uh, one of the first things that we build as web developers. Usually what we do is we build a single page application or a static website. We deploy it to a storage account and then we need to implement a series of API endpoints. Um, and serverless is a great way to implement those endpoints. Um, the API will then go and read data from a database and then return those results to, uh, to our web applications. Um, and the reason why serverless is uh, a great fit for building APIs is because of its ability to listen to HTTP requests at a given URL. Um, at a very high level, a web application is a collection of URLs that we can call from our client applications. Another great use case for uh, serverless for building serverless applications or um, building serverless functions is when we're processing data. So think about all those CSV files um, or all those images that need resizing. Um, what we usually do is we place them in a, we can place them in a storage account and then that new object being added in a storage account, it actually can trigger an event that will execute a function that will then go ahead and parse that CSV file and save that data into a database, or maybe take that image um, and resize it into all different sizes that we need for different devices and save that back into a storage account. Um, another, another great use case for serverless is actually third-party integration with other APIs or integration with third-party APIs. Many times um, we are building client applications that are calling other services, um, which we usually call, as you'll see later, I'm giving you a sneak preview here, um, it's actually a backend as a service. Let's say that you build a web application, an e-commerce site that uses Stripe for its payment. And whenever you're making requests to the Stripe API, you need to authenticate those requests. Now, let's assume that um, in your web application, currently it's, um, it's all deployed on the client side and you need to make this payment. In order to authenticate your request, you would have to create a new web server, deploy it somewhere, and basically add that thin wrapper on top of your existing requests where you actually authenticate your, um, your request. And you do that by adding your API key. Now, Instead of spinning up a whole new server and um, deploying it somewhere in the cloud, what you can do is create a, a, a wrapper function that will listen to um, HTTP requests and then it will, uh, it will authorize your request to go to Stripe and, and then return the response. Another key use case is building chatbots. You will find a lot of examples around this, but basically given it's um, a synchronous na nature and um, the fact that probably 
you don't need to have a chatbot that runs every single time, but rather um, whenever a customer opens a chat and sends a message, then you can have a chatbot to um, reply to those particular messages in a short amount of time. Uh, there's many different other types of use cases that work really well with serverless, and I've just given you a few examples. Uh, but I, I recommend you go to Cloud Native Computing Foundation on GitHub and they, they published a white paper there and the authors have identified four different types of workloads that are usually a good fit for serverless. Um, when you're building asynchronous applications that are asynchronous, concurrent, um, and they're easy to parallelize, um, then serverless is a good fit for these types of workloads. Um, they're also a good type, uh, a good type of um, pattern to use when you have infrequent or like spiky traffic, unpredictable um, variance in scaling requirements, um, and then it's also a great tool to use when you you have highly dynamic um, requirements in terms of business, um, and those drive a need for accelerator accelerated developer velocity. So imagine you are working in a startup or you're really just um, build, building your own product and you need to be very fast in delivering features so that you learn quickly from your users. Um, serverless usually enables you to do that because it you don't have to spend all that upfront time for configuring servers, understanding, hey, what are the, what are the requirements that I have in terms of workload and it also helps you when you need to choose different programming languages and connect to different data sources. So there's a lot of there's a lot of time saving when you're building serverless applications. And remember, you you want to spend the minimal amount of time on solving the exact problem that you need to address. Um, if you're in the business of configuring and managing databases and servers. By all means, you should spend all of that time on, on, on those particular tasks. But if you want to work out an idea and see if there's something to it with the minimum cost and the minimum amount of time spent on uh, writing that code, then serverless might actually be your best choice. And of course, the last thing when you're building products, the last thing that you want to do is spend time on anything else other than figuring out what is your actual um, what is your actual problem that you're solving and making sure that you hone in to that particular problem. Right. So I'm I'm thinking that you're more and more excited um, and you want to kind of get your feet wet. I hope that's an expression. Uh, and you actually want to get started. So how how do you do that? Well, the first thing that you need to know about serverless is that, well, you already know that it's a misnomer and um, it confuses a lot because uh, it kind of hints at not not having servers, but actually your code does run on servers. Uh, but a, a more broader definition, I think, is um, that when we're looking at serverless applications, there's two different components to it. The first one is being able to use backend as a service um, applications and then integrating that with functions as a service. Um, so think about this, you, you're using APIs like Stripe or Auth0 or Active Directory for your authentication, you're using, um, you're using blob storage, you're using all sorts of managed services that are being deployed and managed by other providers and then you need to have that code that connects all those backend services. Um, so those are the two main components. And you might already be using serverless components. I already hinted a bit at this, but when your application relies on services like Azure Storage or AWS S3 or Netlify authentication or forms, you're already benefiting from using a serverless architecture because fully managed and highly scalable services are core tenants of any serverless system. 
They basically clear the path for us to focus on features that are truly relevant to our product by removing the need for us to learn how to configure and host them. And sure, at, at some point, it might actually make sense for you to build your own solutions for this. Uh, Dropbox, for example, eventually decided to move off of S3 uh, so that they build their own custom hardware after many years of running successfully on S3. But then again, it might not. Um, Netflix is still using S3. Um, whenever we hit play on our favorite show using Netflix, the data comes off of a serverless data store. And at the core of serverless computing are also cloud functions. They enable us to run code in ephemeral containers and in, a re in reaction to an event. And the execution can be triggered by any of the managed services or some of the custom sources that you might define. Um, in your functions, there are a couple, there's a couple of things that you need to be aware of. Um, you'll end up writing code mostly in the same way that you did before, using the same programming languages that you normally use. Uh, but because your code is running in ephemeral containers, and for us to be able to scale out your code infinitely, uh, you'll need to write stateless code. Your, your compute is separated from your data storage. Uh, and this means that you cannot rely on any state being preserved between function calls. And if you do end up having to save state, then you're going to have to use a data store like a message queue or a database that will scale in a similar way as your serverless functions. And your code will run in response to specific triggers, which can be of type HTTP when we react to HTTP requests. Um, it can be a blob trigger when we run code in reaction to a file being uploaded to a storage account, or um, even let's say we want to uh, listen to changes that are being made to database records. We can run code in reaction to a database record being changed. Um, other commonly used triggers uh, can be of type queue when a message is being uploaded uh, on a queue or time triggers. Uh, this is one of the uh, one of the most common use cases as well when basically you want to you want to trigger a run um, at a given time interval. Um, let's say you want to clean up your database every single day at midnight. Um, you can do that using serverless. And the anatomy, anatomy of a serverless processing model is pretty much what you're seeing here on, on this slide. Uh, we basically have a series of event sources or triggers, and they cause the function to, to run. Um, you have the serverless controller that will go ahead and deploy, control, and monitor function instances in their sources. And then you have the actual function instances, which is a single function or a nano service uh, that can be scaled with demand, depending on how many incoming uh, requests you have. And then at the bottom there, you have the managed services. Those are your data stores, authentication providers, um, your events uh, that you want to be sending. And a scale controller will be using heuristics for each event type. Um, so for example, when you're listening to queue events, um, it will scale based off of the queue length and the age of the oldest message um, on the queue. And when no events are triggering to your code to run, then the scale controller will reduce the number of instances running to zero. But with every new technology, we kind of need to figure out what kind of tools are available for us and how we can integrate into our how we can integrate them into our existing tool set. Um, and when we get started with serverless, we have a few options to consider. Um, so the first thing that uh, the first tool that you can use when you're building serverless applications is actually your browser. Um, you can go ahead into your cloud providers portal um, or web application. And then from there, you can actually get a lot of things done. 
Um, so you can see in this particular um, slide that you have the ability to create new functions here. Um, you also have the ability to write all of the code in the browser, um, but also run that code. So on the right hand side, you can click this button that will test your functions. And then at the, um, at the bottom, you can see all of the logs associated with a particular run in your function. And this is all great. This is fantastic. If you're just getting started and you want to test out like what is this serverless thing and how do I actually create a, an API endpoint very easily, it's great to just go to the browser and create that new function. Uh, but as you get more accustomed to new concepts and become more and more productive, you might actually want to be using your local environment so you can continue um, using your typical deployment workflow. And typically you'll, you'll want support for a couple of things. You want to be able to write code in your editor of choice. Um, you, you want to be using tools that are doing all the heavy lifting and generating boilerplate code for you, especially if that's not code that's necessarily relevant for you. Um, I, I think it's extremely important that I can debug and run my code locally. Um, it would be a, an absolute pain to, be, to have to write code, deploy it to the cloud, write there a print statement, and then check out the logs to see whether my code has executed correctly or not, and then come back and edit that um, as well. And I also want to be able to quickly deploy my code. Um, if it takes a very long time for my code to be deployed, then it's going to be breaking my usual um, deployment, um, deployment um, habits, let's say. As a developer, I care very much about my tool set, my processes, and all of the... Uh, the ability to be very fast as I'm as I'm writing code, and as you might guess, VS Code is a great tool to be using in um, in with Azure Functions. Um, and actually, one of the reasons why you can use Azure Functions in your local um, in your local environment is because um, its runtime is open source. So basically, we're running in in your local, we're running a version of the Azure Functions runtime that's running in the cloud as well. Um, so that gives you the ability to run and debug. And like it also gives you the confidence that what you're running in your local environment will actually end up running exactly the same in your cloud environment as well. And using VS Code <coughs> and the Azure Functions extension, you're going to be able to create new functions, run them in your local, debug them and um, and then deploy them to the cloud. So all of the development lifecycle life there, um, it's very much embedded into your Visual Studio Code Azure Functions extension. Right, so we've talked a lot, but we haven't seen a lot of code. Um, and I thought of all the types of applications that I could build, and I'm a huge, huge fan of Parks and Recreation. I hope that there's a few others of you there that love Parks and Recreation. Um, and in one of the episodes, the team there in Parks and Recreation, they, uh, they built uh, a board where they find each other's spirit dog. Um, and I thought that this is actually a great use case both for serverless and for exercising some of my minimum um, AIML skills. Um, and I've used for this serverless, but also a tool called Custom Vision AI, which is an, uh, an, a tool for machine learning uh, that allows me to use APIs and transfer learning. And I don't have to know a lot about AI machine learning. The only thing that I have to do is uh, basically upload images, tag them, and then this will generate a model uh, that I can then use to do image recognition. Um, 
And I can do that very easily using a UI, but they also have an API that you can use in your code. So I thought that, hey, maybe it's a good idea to use their API um, and go through those steps using serverless functions. So the first thing that I had to do was to find a good data set of uh, dogs and dog pictures. And turns out that Stanford has already put together a, a data set that has lots of dog pictures. Um, and it's available on Kaggle.com. So if you want to build this application yourself, uh, you can find that data set on Kaggle.com. Um, and then just to summarize some of the steps that I, I had to do in order to build this application um, and to build this model that will then help me predict what dog resembles the most a character or a picture. <clears throat> what we need to do is parse all of the images that are being uh, are part of the data set. And then for each particular breed, uh, like let's say golden retriever or um, um, Samoyed, uh, we, we need to create a tag for that particular breed. And then we need to upload a set of images that are, um, <clears throat> are, are of that dog. And then we have to repeat that for all of the available breeds. And finally, we have to train our model so that it can help us predict them. And this is how custom vision AI looks like. Um, as you can see in the background, I have a series of, on, on the uh, left-hand side, I have a series of tags, uh, like let's say Basset, um, Dingo, English Springer, um, Pekinez. So all of those are tags that I've created using code. And then um, they have a number of images that are being, uh, are being um, uploaded or have been uploaded for that particular tag. Uh, but it, what you can see here is also that I can run a quick test here where I can upload an image or give it an URL and then it will give me a prediction, a list of predictions, which is uh, <clears throat> a list of prob pro pro probabilities uh, attached to a particular tag. So in this instance, you can see that Leslie Nope looks like a golden retriever and the model tells us that it has 44 percent um, confidence in this particular probability this is not a high probability but i absolutely love leslie nope so i thought that um, regardless of how well the model performed i am still going to include it in these slides and to, to, to implement this, um, the training of this model, I used a thing that's called Azure Durable Function Functions. And Azure Durable Functions are an extension of Azure Functions that lets us write stateful functions in a serverless compute environment. And with Azure Durable Functions, we can define workflows directly in code. Um, we can do that um, in code like uh, writing C Sharp or F Sharp or JavaScript code. And as you can imagine, I've been excited about the JavaScript option. Um, and we can use powerful abstractions um, and constructs like generator functions, async await, um, but we can also, it's useful to be able to use different uh, abstractions that allow us to do function chaining um, or it allows us to define retries. One of the, um, the concerns with serverless is that it's a lot more difficult to define a retry strategy, whereas using uh, stateful workflows, we can, we can do that using constructs and abstractions that have been implemented as part of the platform itself. Uh, we can also do things like broadcasting. So if we have tasks that need to be executed in parallel, um, then we can, um, we can create those tasks and then we can aggregate the results of those particular tasks. Um, and then we can also interact with external asynchronous web service. So there's, there's a lot of possibilities there. Uh, but the thing that uh, that's also important is that um, it offers orchestrators and Azure durable functions, they offer us a complete reflective API as well, that 
allows us to um, access the current state of the of the given workflow or orchestration. Um, it allows us to trigger events and um, to be waiting on uh, orchestrator instances and also terminate them if we're if they're if we decided that hey this is not um, this is actually not working the way I was expecting it to work. I can send a, an event to our orchestrator and our workflow and I will actually terminate that particular instance. And there's there's multiple types of functions uh, that we can find in a um, in an orchestrator or in a workflow in itself. But there's two that are really important. So the first one is the orchestrator function, which actually describes how functions are executed and the, the, the order in which those um, actions are being executed. Um, and unlike orchestrator, the other, the other type of function is the activity function. And unlike orchestrator functions which have to be non-deterministic because uh, of the ability to replay um, orchestrators at any given time. Activity functions are, are basically a basic unit of work in a durable function orchestrator. Um, and they are functions and tasks that are orchestrator orchestrated in the process um, and they, they don't have any restriction in terms of the type of work that you can do in them. Uh, so activity functions are usually um, used to make network calls, um, run CPU intensive operations, and it will return back data to the orchestrator function. Um, and then the durable task framework um, will guarantee that each called activity function will be executed at least once during an orchestrator's execution. And the last bit that's important um, uh, in this, the, the last type of function that's important in this particular um, in this particular framework is the client function. And the client function is the one that triggers the orchestrator function. Um, and the orchestrator function will basically um, model how the order in which our activity functions are being executed um, and making sure that um, that is that state is being uh, passed on and um, that we return a status as well. So going back to our example, um, what we have here is just three very, very um, at, like simple steps that will help us train our model in custom, in custom vision AI. Um, so the first thing that we need to do is given our dogs data set, we'll want to get the list of breeds, uh, dog breeds, and then iterate on that array of dog breeds and um, actually kickstart a sub orchestrator that in parallel will execute another series of steps like um, uploading images, creating a tag, and um, getting the list of images itself. And then once all of those tasks for each breed are, um, are, are finished, completed, then we can go ahead and call a final step, which is training our model. Um, and if you're curious how this looks like in code, um, you're gonna be able to find this particular project on GitHub um, and on my profile as well. But here's a snippet of the main arch orchestrator that we're executing um, as part of our workflow. So you can see here that we're using a generator function that gets as a parameter a context object. And then using that context object, um, we can call activity functions and we can call sub orchestrators um, in our function. Um, so the first line there, we're getting the list of dog breeds that we need to upload into our custom vision AI. Then we are kicking off in parallel a series of um, sub orchestrator execution. And then when all of these tasks are finished, we're gonna go ahead and train our model because we don't want to train model with uh, data that is inconsistent. And then if you're curious how an activity function looks like, you're gonna be surprised to see that it's a JavaScript function. Um, in this case, we are basically um, 
this function will create a tag in custom in the custom vision um, AI API. Um, and you can see here that in our function, we get the context object as a parameter, then we are um, calling the create tag um, function here which basically makes a call to the API and sending as parameters the name of the breed um, and then returning the data. So really code that's very familiar to any of you that have uh, that wrote JavaScript code. And then the result is that we can absolutely go ahead and uh, upload an image of Leslie Nope or um, of yourself or myself. And then the model we give will give us a prediction um, and a list of probabilities of how likely it is that this particular person resembles, let's say, a golden retriever or a terrier or a... a what else? A Labrador retriever or a chow. <clears throat> All right. I hope that was an, a fun project. I'll share with you the URL as well to the, to the GitHub repository and let me know if you, uh, if you have any questions there. Uh, but we've seen, we've seen what are some of the basic concepts behind serverless. We've seen what are some of the most uh, common use cases, and we've seen in practice, what are some of the tools that we can use and how would we go about building stateful workflows? Um, there's two particular um, best practices or recommendation that I'd like to share with you uh, because this looks very exciting, but there's certain things that we need to keep in mind when we're building serverless applications. Um, and the first one is to make sure that our function is abiding the sing single responsibility principle, uh, which states that every module class or function should have responsibility over a single part of the functionality provided by the software. And that responsibility should be entirely encapsulated by the function. And the same is very important in the serverless approach as well. A function app should do a single thing um, and how you separate that functionality into different functions will actually determine how your function scales and it will end up impacting your deployment strategy as well. So you want to find the critical path, the critical components in your application and make sure that you isolate them in separate functions so that um, they don't uh, influence each other and they don't impact each other. Um, it's also important that you have a very clear understanding of how your system scales and which are your bottlenecks. There is no use in an application that can accept 500 HTTP requests per second, but then your database um, can only handle um, 10 connections. Um, and otherwise your system will become very quickly overloaded and you'll end up with very unhappy users. Um, and it is recommended that all of your components in your application scale at similar pace. Um, and you can achieve that either by using managed services that auto scale at the same rate as your serverless functions, or by having really smart throttling strategies in place um, that basically slow down how you can how much your platform and your serverless functions scale um, so that it aligns to the capabilities of your other components. Serverless enables us to solve problems creatively and at a fraction of the cost that we usually pay for using traditional problems, uh, traditional platforms. And it is, when, when I say a fraction of a cost, I'm, I'm not only referring to uh, to money, but also development time. And our serverless applications can truly scale with our organization and with our product development by enabling us to onboard users as we grow um, and as we scale. Um, and I have nothing but gratitude and hopeful feelings about how your products and your companies are going to change the world. And based on my experience using serverless, I know that this technology is going to serve you well in achieving your goals. And I'm really, truly excited that is, it is here for you to keep making the world a better place. Thank you so much.